Good morning, everybody. Real pleasure to have you with us here today. I am very, very grateful that uh, the Annals of Physics and Elsevier and the World Science Festival decided to organize this session on big data and the future of physics, um, because I love to be part of it. My name's John Rennie. Uh, I'm deputy editor at the science magazine Quanta, used to be the editor-in-chief of Scientific American. Um, and I, it's therefore really wonderful to get to be a chance to even be a participant as moderator in today in a conversation about what I think is really one of the most important topics of discussion uh, for uh, science, not just physics, but I think even more broadly. And I think a lot of the, uh, the topics that we will, we will be touching on today will have very broad relevance uh, throughout science. So when we, we talk about big data, as all of you know very well, we're talking about gigantic voluminous databases and the analytical techniques we use to try to mine those for useful information. I think it's an interesting thing about the, the, the big data revolution in modern life that we don't actually have to go to a field like physics uh, to find that uh, big data is, is relevant. It's relevant in, in lots of other sciences. Big data is, is after all, what powers Facebook and Google and all the other sorts of aspects of everyday life. But the big data of physics goes way beyond what's meant by big data in, in those other contexts. And I th therefore, a lot of specific sorts of challenges that come up, the, the, the volume, the velocity with which it's changing, and the variety of the data, uh, of big data within physics, are all gigantic hurdles that have to be overcome. And they are challenges at every possible level. They are challenges to the systems that are developed for handling these, um, to, to experimental design, uh, to the human ingenuity and skills in being able to handle all of these, uh, even just actually to the, the aspects of being able to share the fruits of knowledge uh, that come, come out of these. Even that is made more difficult by some of the natures. It's a, it's a qualitative change from a lot of the science that we practiced in the past. Uh, a lot has been done to overcome some of those kinds of challenges, but new ones keep arising. So it's an ongoing um, process that's, that's still evolving to that end. And the, the problems that come up, they aren't even just restricted to those for the, for the, the scientists in the enterprise of, of science. Um, there, are, there are administrative issues, there are legal issues, publishing issues, philosophical issues. Um, in fact, I, and I'll say this really as just sort of a footnote to today's discussion, where we are focusing so much on physics, um, but really the, the other fields of science are also increasingly grappling with their own types of big data problems. And in my experience and from where I'm sitting, it seems as though they, many of them are looking to physics and astrophysics and, and related fields that have more experience for good models about how they should press forward with all of those. So for all these reasons, that's why it's so essential that we are in a situation where we can be sharing the ideas of best practices uh, for uh, dealing with big data and introspection about where big data is taking physics. And it's ver therefore very, very exciting that we have a chance to do all of that today. Um, we're very lucky that with this morning's program, we get to have a variety of perspectives that I think will complement one another very, very nicely, as you'll see. Um, they'll, we'll he'll be hearing those from physicists and others involved uh, in fostering collaboration and communicate uh, that uh, you, you are rising as well. So having promised you, of course, a great field of speakers, let me just say that who, they are, who, who you'll be hearing from. Um, you'll be hearing, of course, from uh, Dr. Kirk Bourne, a data scientist and astrophysicist formerly with NASA and currently at Booz Allen Hamilton. You'll be hearing from Michael Hildreth, a professor of physics at the University of Notre Dame, uh, from uh, Anita De Vard, uh, who is a physicist and uh, also a physics publisher uh, with Elsevier. Um, but if, first of all, we'll be turning to someone with the home field advantage. Uh, it's, uh, he is the professor and chair of the Columbia University Physics Department. He's an experimental particle physicist whose early research focused on the spectroscopy uh, using the CUSB detector at the Cornell Electron Storage Ring. Um, at current, uh, presently, he's uh, working on the D0 experiments on the fundamental nature of, of matter at Fermilab using the Tevatron and the Atlas experiments at the uh, Large Hadron Collider. Um, so please welcome, if you will, Professor Michael Tutts. Thank you very much. Um, so what I want to do is to uh, 
give you one example to look at big data and particle physics, but to look at it in the context of the experiment that I work on, which is the ATLAS experiment uh, at the Large Hadron Collider. So what I wanted to do was to try and, and give you some context for it, so uh, show you uh, who we are, uh, what the experiment is, what is this data that we're collecting, uh, and then show you how, you know, some of the, the, the numbers associated with that. So let me start just to remind you the, uh, uh, we're big. Not only is the data big, but the collaboration's big. We have 3,000 physicists that work on the, uh, on the experiment. We have about 1,200 graduate students on the experiment. We come from about 182 institutes from, from uh, 38 countries. In the U.S. alone, there are 44 institutions that are on ATLAS. And um, the other large experiment, CMS, that Mike Hildreth is on is sort of comparable in size to this. So we've had up to date about 600 publications to date. Um, and if you don't know, we're located in, in uh, CERN uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, and use the Large Hadron Collider as our, experiment, as our uh, accelerator. And we have four experiments there. There is the Atlas Detector, which I'll talk to you about, the CMS, and um, also somewhat smaller experiments, Elise and LHCV. Um, you can see in the, in the map over there that the, uh, the sun never sets on the Atlas <laughs> Empire because uh, someone is yellow, that's representing where they are. So let me just start by uh, trying to give you a brief introduction of what it is that we're trying to do there. Um, Fundamentally, we're trying to answer the basic questions of what are the fundamental particles and forces that make up um, the sort of you, me, the stuff that we see over here. So uh, in that sense, the picture that you have, that we have at the moment, is that at the fundamental level, we have quarks. And if we take two of them, these up and down quarks, you can use those to combine those to make the protons and neutrons, then add to them the, the leptons, namely the electron that you see over here, and you've got atoms, and once you've got atoms, you've got molecules, and you've got us. Right, so this describes most of what we, uh, what we see. And then on the, on the right-hand side over there, you see the, uh, fundament the particles that carry the, the fundamental forces, namely the electromagnetic force from the photon, the uh, strong force that binds the quarks, that's the gluons, and then the W and Z particles that are responsible for the radioactive decay. But that's not the full picture. Um, there are still questions that remain. Just if I use some numbers, I'll, I'll use uh, units of energy, which are GeV, but even make it simpler than that. Around 1 GeV is the mass of a proton. So we can talk about things in, in units of the mass of a proton. Um, so uh, so it, the full picture then looks a little bit more complicated. Now you see there are three families of quarks and three families of leptons. And so one of the important questions that remains to to be asked is why are there these three families uh, of, of quarks and leptons that you see here? I mean, there was the, originally when the muon was discovered, Robbie, who used to be here at, at Columbia, was the guy who asked, you know, who ordered that? Because it <laughs> sort of looked like an electron, but a little heavier. And so you're seeing these three families, which kind of look, uh, look the same, but they're going heavier as you go off to the right. So uh, that's one. Then the other is that the masses of these elementary particles are quite different, as I'll indicate in a moment. And one deep question to ask is, how do they acquire their mass? What is that, that mechanism by which they do that? So for example, if you look at the, at the photon and the gluons, they're massless. So zero times the mass of a proton. Whereas if you look at the Zs and Ws, they're massive and roughly speaking about 100 times the mass of a proton. And again, if you look on the quark side, I didn't put it on here, but the top quark is about 175 times the mass of a proton, and the up and down quarks are very light. So one question is, how, how, do, they, how do they acquire their mass? And a theory that had been standing around for a long time, for the last more than 50 years or so, uh, was the so-called Higgs mechanism. And so what we were looking for, one of the, the great um, uh, ideas was for us to try and look for the, uh, for the uh, Higgs boson, and that's the guy that appears over here in the middle of this. And as you know, sort of in 2013, the Nobel Prize was given to, to uh, Higgs and Englert for uh, ultimately um, this, the, the theory explaining the Higgs boson. Although there was a shout out to the experiments because uh, <laughs> without us, they wouldn't have gotten the prize because we discovered it. But 
you know, then you have to give the prize to 6,000 physicists, and uh, they don't even fit in the... Uh, 35 centimeters. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. <Sorry. laughs> um, so then, of course, the question is, that's the standard model of particle physics, but what lies beyond that? That's, of course, an intriguing question. There are certainly many ideas about what that might be, um, and that's one of the things, of course, that we're looking for or will be looking for now. So, again, to give you a, a brief introduction to the experiment and the accelerator, I'm just going to show you this, this video clip. You recognize this place. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to zoom in on uh, Geneva, Switzerland. So it's right at the end of, of Lake Geneva at the bottom there that you see zooming in. And there is a tunnel 17 miles in circumference that basically is just around that area around Geneva. And so what we're doing now is zooming in over the CERN site and we're going to zoom over to the Atlas control room, which is the building that you see here. Now, the real action occurs 100 meters underground in a cavern that's attached to this 17-mile circumference ring. So if you open up the cavern over here, what you have then is the Atlas detector. So this is what you're seeing over here. And we're going to pull out pieces of it, like a pieces of onion, uh, to see the different layers. I'm not going to have time to describe each, but what it is that each of these detectors that will come flying out at us are special detectors for identifying particular kinds of particles. This one called the tile calorimeter looks at what are called hadronic particles. If you now go in a little further and pull this apart, you come to something called the electromagnetic calorimeter, and those, that device is used for measuring essentially electrons and um, photons well. So as we go in deeper, you finally come to a place which is called the inner tracker, and that uses the technology uh, that you have in your cell phone, silicon technology, to very finely measure the positions of particles, uh, charged particles, as they emerge from the collision. This is to give you, we don't like people who walk on our detector, <laughs> but, but this is just to give you a sense of scale uh, over here. That's a regular sized person, and as you pull back, you suddenly realize, my God, that is a big detector. So it's uh, 25 meters tall, 44 meters wide. Um, what you see now is coming in from both sides, the red dot, that's supposed to represent uh, 100 billion protons on one side, 100 billion protons on the other. They collide in the center of the detector. Most of the 100 billion go right by each other. Uh, but a few collide, maybe up to a couple of hundred eventually. And then what you see is this uh, mess of lines that you see over there represents the sort of picture that we take, which is uh, the basically the energies and the positions of the, of the particles that uh, are produced in the collision. So basically we use, of course, E equals mc squared. We take the E from the collision, the high energy of those protons, and convert it to the m side, the mass side, to produce new particles. And you get a spray of new particles, and think of the Atlas detector as kind of a 100 megapixel camera, right, that's used to take pictures, digital pictures, of this collision that occurs. And then what we want to do is, of course, to analyze those, those pictures to try and identify interesting uh, events in that, uh, in that picture. Um, now, you know, sometimes I say this, people go, well, okay, you've got 100 million channels, that's a 100 megapixel camera. Uh, I've got 20 megapixels in my pocket, uh, you know, and it only cost me 100 bucks, and this is a billion dollars. So w what's the difference? Well, part of the difference is that we, we can take 40, 40 million pictures per second, uh, yours goes, whatever, 10, 20 <laughs> pictures per second or so. And then, of course, it needs to be that size because it has to capture the energy of these very energetic particles that are produced. So what I wanted to do was give you a sense of what is it that we're recording, right? Um, as I say, it's about a 100 megapixel digital camera, if you like to think of it that way, taking 40 million pictures per second with each of these bunches that, that collide with 100 billion protons in each bunch. And I'm going to show you now a little bit more detailed picture over here, which shows you what, um, what it is that that data is in a little bit more uh, a little bit more detail. So let's look again. Here are the 100 billion protons. They're in that detector, which now has these beautiful colors over here. But what you see happening is that you see, <coughs> excuse me, you see um, yellow, these sort of yellow and green blobs, and you see the white lines. Those represent um, the energy deposits in the detector that we have over here. So it's these blobs where we measure the energy of those and the energy over here and the tracks through that inner tracker that we saw earlier and use this to then determine what it is that we're seeing over there. But what's the challenge? The challenge is the following. 
there are a lot of pictures. Remember that we collide these things 40 million times per second. We can't afford to take all 40 million of those pictures and analyze them later. So the trick is to get rid of the crap and keep the good stuff. Um, and so for that, we have a trigger and, and data acquisition uh, system. And just to give you some of the numbers and give you a sense of scale, each of these, let me refer to them as pictures, each of these pictures is about one megabyte or so in size. Might be a little one and a half or so, but roughly speaking about that size. Um, and that's, you might say, wait a minute, you said you had 100 megapixels, but most of them are empty channels, so you don't need to use those. So when you compress it down, it's about one megabyte per picture. So if you ask that you take 40, you start off with 40 million pictures per second, that's 40 terabytes of data coming through from the Atlas detector. That's an enormous amount of data. So what we do to try and filter that is through this trigger and data acquisition to, um, uh, first, we have custom hardware that works in on the order of two and a half microseconds and manages to throw away a lot. It reduces that 40 million down to 100,000 per second pictures. And now you're talking about 100 gigabytes per second. Uh, after that, it then goes through essentially what is a set of, uh, of uh, commodity PCs as part of the detector, uh, a lot, on the order of 30,000 cores or so, uh, that then takes that uh, 100,000 per second, 100 kilohertz rate into about 1,000 per second, so about a gigabyte per second, and that's then the stuff that gets stored and written to, to, uh, to disk or, or, or to tape that you see. If you do the numbers over here, it's not, it might not be that impressive. It's a couple of petabytes uh, of raw data that goes to storage in this form, but as you'll see, that's not everything. There's a whole lot more that then gets, uh, goes in. And, and the challenge, as I mentioned, is kind of not to throw out the baby with the bathwater because sort of one picture in 100 billion uh, is, for example, the, the Higgs boson. So you have to be careful to, to try and keep the interesting stuff and throw away the stuff you're not interested in. And that's certainly one of the big challenges. Um, as I mentioned, it's not just um, that two petabytes that I talked about over there, that raw data. But you have to do something with that raw data. It's, that's just a bunch of telling you what detector was hit, what energy, for example, or what, what electrical signal you saw in that, in that device. So you have to reconstruct out of all that raw data, uh, those hundred million or so locations, so to speak, um, what the values are of, of positions and energies of these particles that are coming out. And eventually, you want to convert it to, so to objects. You'd like to have it sort of in the physics language. Where are the electrons? Where are the muons? Where are the jets? And so forth. That, that's the stuff that can be studied by physicists. So I just wanted to give you, again, a little uh, sample of that. Here are the bunch of hits that you see in that inner detector. And what you have to do with those hits is then say, oh, wait a minute, which ones belong to uh, a particular particle? And so you have to do this sort of reconstruction to say, aha, I can align them up in this way, and I can associate tracks with all of those particles coming out. That's ultimately sort of what you want to look at, and there may be some particularly interesting ones, the ones that are shown here uh, in, in, colored, uh, in the colored view. And then you can do an analysis on that and say, for example, by measuring the angle which they bend, I can ultimately figure out the momentum and the energy, and that's the stuff ultimately that the physicists want to look at are these sort of four vectors, energy and momentum, and now you keep on doing this, right? So here you are, you ultimately do the same analysis. This goes on a little uh, too long, but then you have to start doing it faster and faster. Um, so I think it goes faster and faster here. Let me just, see. yeah, okay, there it goes. So, right, so that's what you have to do, <laughs> go, go, go really fast. Um, and that means that there are many different types of data that you're actually storing. There is the raw data that we talked about earlier, the first stuff, but then, and, and sorry for the jargon over here, but just to give you some sense of it, there's something we call ESD, event summary data, that's created from the raw data, and, and that provides kind of a detailed output of the detector reconstruction. So you have to reconstruct and say what it is in more uh, physics-like units over there. That's not actually what's used usually for the analysis, but things that are called AODs, analysis object data, that's where you sort of create from this ESD um, reconstructed events which contain sufficient information now to actually do the physics analysis. 
And then there are things like uh, DPDs, these are derived physics data. So at each level you get more and more sophisticated and start making summaries of, uh, of the stuff. But now you need to keep most of that. So the other thing which I haven't talked about is for all the data that you actually accumulate, you also need to understand what you would predict. So you need simulation and you need vast amounts of simulation data. So roughly speaking, for every data event you might need two uh, or so simulated events. And so you have to also uh, do that and store that. So uh, here's some view with some numbers which, uh, well, okay, maybe we don't need, but so the raw data is about, as we said, about a, uh, a, uh, a megabyte. And then you store copies of that, and so this is indicating what, uh, what disk and tape versions that you store. There's the thing that we call the ESDs. That actually blows up, but then when you uh, summarize it a bit more in these AODs, you get it down to about a third of that size, but you have many more of those. And so this just illustrates what that is, starting from the raw data. The, the blue and the, gr and the green indicate that this is the stuff you keep. This you only keep transiently. So ultimately you end up at this side over here, and that's the place where physicists come in and then analyze the data at that point. Um, you do the same thing for the Monte Carlo, I don't want to dwell on this, except that, so this piece kind of looks the same as what you saw, but on the other hand, you now have to generate the simulated data, and you have to put hits, simulate them in the detector, and then do the same analysis that you do uh, when you have actual data. And again, you can see some of the sizes over here of that stuff. And so what I thought you know, might be interesting is to indicate how much data uh, do we have and what kind of data is it. So here you see a view of the, um, I haven't talked about it, but there's a tiered computing structure, which I'll mention a little bit later. And this talks about the tier one and tier two disk space that you have. Um, and and what, what is it that occupies that disk space and how big is it? This is, both sides, the left and right, are actually the same uh, actual data, but it's broken up in different ways. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, what it is that you're keeping in terms of, of data and simulation, a and you see that the simulated data takes up a lot. If you can't see the scale over here, you're approaching something like 120 petabytes of data. Right? So it's a very large data set. But it's not because of the raw data that you were collecting, but it's all the other stuff that you've done, and it's all the stuff that you've collected from the previous years of running. So you see here data sets for, this last run was for 2016. You see it growing uh, as in time over here. You see that you started doing the simulation sometime uh, before to get that data, simulated data ready. But you have old data over here, 2015, 2012, simulated data and so forth. You can break it up in a different way. So it's the same ultimate plot, but broken up differently by the types of data that you store on tape. So here's the raw data, for example. Here's these derived data, these AODs, as they're called. And you see they take up the big bulk of, that, uh, of the data that we store. So around 100 petabytes of disk space for our experiment alone. I won't dwell on this. This is the same thing for tape. So you could look at how much data do you store on tape. So where do you keep all this stuff? Um, well, there's something called the Worldwide LCG Computing Grid, or WLCG. Um, I have some sort of numbers here. Here you see the little pins are all the places where there is a, a computing uh, center. There's a tiered system which consists of a uh, tier zero, which is located at CERN and is actually a satellite one in, in Budapest. Um, tier one centers, of which there are around uh, 10 or so, those are national centers. The one here in the US for Atlas is actually a Brookhaven lab, so you know, 60 miles from here. Um, the tier two centers are regional centers, so within typically a country, there are a few. And the tier threes are ultimately what the physicist has their hand on. So 167 computing sites distributed over 42 countries. If you take for all the experiments, about 1,000 petabytes of storage, about half of that in disk and half of that in tape, about 700,000 CPU cores. So it's big. And you know it looks kind of nice in this picture over here, but underlying it in the... Uh, the networking system is kind of messy. <laughs> so you see where it is over here. Here's the, the North America, Europe, Asia, uh, South America, and how these things are all interconnected via this, um, this grid. In the US, it goes by the name of the Open Science Grid. And it also services other, uh, other sciences besides 
uh, the LHC uh, data that you have here, and people can use that sort of um, opportunistically if, if we're not using it. So is it big data? Sure. 200 petabytes on disk and tape. You know, you say 200 petabytes, it's hard to get a sense for it. I don't know, your, your laptop, if it's a good laptop, might have a terabyte disk in it. That's 200,000 of those. That's a lot. Um, if you take DVDs, 10 gigabyte DVDs, you need 20 million of those. And if you stack them, they're 24 kilometers high. There's a lot of data. 100,000 data sets, a billion files that we have, and the traffic between the sites averages about 20 gigabytes per second. So what are the challenges? Let me end by that. So uh, we're doing data mining analysis. We need, I think, probably in some sense to get smarter. We're starting to use advanced techniques for doing it, you know, like deep machine learning. Um, we have to learn to sort of use the CPUs that we have to, to best advantage. Um, things like multi-threading when you compute. I, I'm now talking about things I don't actually know what they are, but um, experts certainly do. And, and then opportunistic resources, high performance computing centers, cloud computing, we actually use those uh, as well. And we're building towards the future where we expect to upgrade the detector and the accelerator by sort of a factor of 10 on the scale of 2025. And you see what happens dramatically is here you see uh, petabytes. And so we're sitting here at around 200. This is our extrapolation of what we can do with the present money. You see that if we don't do anything, we need about 2,000 petabytes of storage over here. That's a huge amount, not clear ultimately yet how we're going to get uh, to that place. So that's, I just wanted to leave you with that. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mike Tutts, thank you. So Mike gave us one great example uh, from a particle physics perspective about the colossal scale of the, the data and th that can emerge from just one big set of experiments. Um, and there's, of course, just one area of physics. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Kirk Bourne's going to be able to give us a great example of, of a similar sort of example that starts to come from a different area of physics, astrophysics uh, and astronomy. And uh, so we'll, we'll have his work here in just a moment. So uh, Dr. Kirk Bourne is, as I mentioned before, a data scientist and astrophysicist. Um, since 2012, he's been the principal data scientist in the Strategic Innovation Group at Booz Allen Hamilton. He was professor of astrophysics and computational science in George Mason uh, University School of Physics, Astronomy and Computational Sciences. And he spent nearly 20 years supporting NASA projects, including NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and as he'll be able to tell you about more in just a moment, uh, he's been a major contributor to the design and development of the new Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. So with that, Kirk. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there are a lot of really great parallels to uh, the story of astronomy uh, from what Michael just uh, told you about. Uh, but there are some differences. For example, he's, he showed that atlas map with all of the collaborations across the world, and he said they, you know, the sun never sets on the atlas collaboration, but uh, astronomy has telescopes all around the world, so we say that we'll always keep you in the dark. <laughs> but he also talked about the muon uh, being essentially a very heavy elect electron. I remember, uh, so my, my bachelor's degree is in physics, and I remember the first time I heard about muons in, a, in a, my physics class, and the, the professor was telling the story how he, would, he, he was invited to give this talk at a university to the physics department about the muon, which, you know, soon after its discovery or something, I can't remember the exact timing, but anyway, he, he was telling this story, and it was a typical physics colloquium. He probably expected maybe 20 people in the room, you know, the, the faculty and a few grad students, but when he got to the room, uh, they actually had to move it to a, a much larger uh, sort of stadium-style seating, uh, theater seating, uh, undergraduate classroom because the room was packed. It was absolutely packed. And he, and he gets in the room, and he's like, he can't understand. There's, there's all these like freshmen and very young people in the room. And, and said, this is, this is going to be a very heavy theoretical physics talk, you know, <laughs> PhD-level talk. And it's like he didn't quite understand who all these people were in the room. And so uh, uh, he asked the, you know, what was going on, and, and, and someone said, well, this is the talk which had the title, The Moon, A Giant Electron? <laughs> Somebody typoed, okay. <laughs> That's what the announcement said, so anyway. So I will be talking about uh, big data in astronomy, uh, and indeed I worked on the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST, in the center of this graphic here, uh, for quite a few years, and, and a lot of different uh, aspects, including uh, the data management side, the, the, uh, the galaxies research, which is my primary uh, field of research, but also in the, uh, we call the astroinformatics 
side of it, which is the data science, data mining, machine learning uh, aspects of the project, but also the education and public outreach of the project, which includes citizen science projects where we actually put our data in front of citizens who can detect patterns and, and anomalous objects. Humans are really good at that. And so we, we already have a project online, which you may have heard of, called Galaxy Zoo, and a lot of great discoveries have come from things like that. So there's a, there's a couple other projects on here. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk about SKA briefly uh, towards the end, but I won't mention too much about JWST, but I just have it on this slide because it's gonna be the largest telescope we've uh, yet put in space. It'll be launched next year, hopefully. It's the James Webb Space Telescope. And who is James Webb? James Webb was the NASA director during the Apollo years. So uh, named after him, and, and that's, a, a, that's a, a sort of a cardboard cutout there. That's not the actual telescope, uh, but it's on the front lawn of uh, uh, the administration building at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center where I worked for many, many years before going to the university. And so anyway, so these, uh, these telescopes are mostly on the ground that astronomers use, but there are some in space, and so you'll hear some, uh, primarily the things I'm talking about today for big data are ground-based. And there's a reason for that because the, uh, up till uh, recent times, uh, the telemetry uh, from space is very limited bandwidth. So when people said, oh, you had all this big data from, uh, from NASA, I said, no, we had, we had 15,000 different missions, 15,000 different tel uh, experiments at uh, bolted onto telescopes and things, and, th and those 15,000 experiments, the total data volume was less than one terabyte. Mm, I got that on my laptop. Okay, so <laughs> there's, a, there's a very limited amount of uh, bandwidth uh, coming from space. So, so that in terms of data production, it's really coming from the ground-based telescopes because you can really bolt on really huge cameras and things like that to the back of a telescope that doesn't have to be launched into space. Okay, so the big data question in astronomy mostly hints, uh, comes, you know, from these large facilities uh, sitting on the ground. So the uh, the story really starts with astronomy being the world's second oldest <laughs> profession. Uh, that <laughs> that <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so, so, so astronomy is a forensic science, okay, and by that I mean, uh, when you think of forensics, is, is that you have to piece together the evidence to figure out what's going on. Now, that you might say that's all of science, but a lot of science is experimental, so what we just heard about is experimental science. You can collide these beams of protons, and then you can do it again, 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 but we, there's only one universe, and we can't rerun it, okay? So, for example, the LIGO detector, which just detected the gravity wave, uh, first detection of a gravity wave last year about two colliding black holes or neutron stars somewhere in the universe, okay? So if our detectors weren't turned on at that moment, we never would see those things. In 1987, a supernova blew up, which was the first night you know, visible to the naked eye supernova uh, since the time of Tycho Brahe and Kepler, late 1500s, early 1600s. First time, you know, in nearly 400 years, all right? So if we didn't have detectors working at that moment, we would have missed it. Well, of course, you say, oh, it's naked eye. We didn't need detectors. Oh, well, what we did was to prove our theories of astrophysics and stellar nucleosynthesis, we had to, we had, we, there was a specific prediction of the number of neutrinos when they would arrive and what their energies were. And it turns out the detectors were turned on in Japan, so people were able to go back at the, at the predicted time, and sure enough, like 11 neutrinos were detected, or 19 or 18, less than 20, whatever the number was. <laughs> okay, so, so, so the, the, the physics, the fundamental astrophysics and physics was verified in that moment. So if we didn't have that detector turned on, you couldn't say, universe, can you just replay that supernova now so we can see if that works? No, we can't do that. We can't build stars in the lab, we can't go to stars I used to build uh, galaxies in computers, but it's not the same as the real thing. So anyway, so, so we have this forensic science. So, uh, so we, get our, we get our evidence, we get our information about things uh, in the way of a forensic science does. Is you, a, a normal forensic scientist is you piece together all the evidence you can get on all the different angles. And so for us, the different angles are all the different wave bands in which we can detect things from space. Now, it's not just electromagnetic energy. There are other things I've already mentioned, gravity waves. I already mentioned neutrino physics. There's also cosmic rays, which are basically charged high energy particles, like protons, uh, which primarily were ejected from supernova explosions somewhere in the universe, and they just travel through space, and occasionally they hit our, hit our upper atmosphere. We get Cherikov radiation, and all kinds of cool stuff happens, <laughs> okay? But mostly, from my, in my background, my, uh, is more electromagnetic astronomy. And so, uh, so when you think about Hubble telescope in the visible band, okay, that's like one octave of the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? So one, you know, basically one factor of two in wavelength, which, uh, which there are like, you know, like, like 20 orders of magnitude, <laughs> 10 to the 20 order uh, scale there. And it's only one octave in that huge dimension there. So, so the amount of data we can collect is enormous. So telescopes are built to test our theories and to collect data from uh, interesting objects in space. So astronomer, so would say this, this is really our only source of information and it's a really rich source of information. 
So, so the process of science, as you know, I mean, so you collect data, you ask questions, you build models, models and theories to, to, to basically test your theories, and then you refine that, which often leads to more questions, which leads to more data, which leads to more questions. And so I, I've given a version of this talk where it's mostly to a non-science audience. So in, in my current role where I work now, I'm not talking too much about astronomy, but I give a lot of astronomy use cases to people who don't expect it. Uh, so I gave a talk at the Medicare and Medicaid co conference and I gave a talk about astronomy. Uh, they thought that was weird, but until I got through with the story, then, they, then they, after the, the end, they all of a sudden saw the connection to their story. And the whole story is about collecting evidence about something, asking more questions, leading to more data collection, leading to more questions. So that's how you get big data, because you just keep collecting more data to answer more questions, which leads to more data, which leads to more questions, and so on and so on and so on. Right. So, so that's where we are. We're in this big data world because we're trying to figure things out. And so what we see from this is a whole variety of things in space. Okay, so there's a, there's a very rich astronomical zoo, and a lot of the names of these things are actually just uh, descriptive of what they do. Pulsars pulse, colliding galaxies collide, quasars are quasi-stars, black holes are, well, okay. <laughs> so so, we're, so we're, not, we're not too very creative in our name, naming of things. Uh, for example, there's a very famous class of variable stars called Cepheid variable stars, which were actually used to measure the, the, the size, scale, and time scale of age of the universe. And so, uh, so when astronomers were first studying this, they, get, they were wrong by a factor of two different groups who worked on the problem. And it turned out the reason there was a factor two discrepancy because there were two classes of Cepheid variables. And once we finally sorted that out, we were able to get the age of the universe with much higher precision. And so we were very clever, so we called them type one and type two Cepheids. <laughs> and there's different types of supernovae. We call them type one and type two Cepheids, or, uh, supernovae. We also, there's different types of quasars, but we're more creative there. We call them type one and type two and type two A. <laughs> anyway, so you get the picture. So, so, so we, we learned about our universe through the data through these descriptive patterns we, we see in things, but, but ultimately it goes back to fundamental physics. Well, what causes it to do that? Okay, so that's where the real you know, physics and astronomy get together is, is like, what is, there's some fundamental physics that's causing this thing to behave this way, and that's what we try to piece that story together. And so back in my days when I worked at NASA, I worked at this facility, uh, which was, used to be called the National Space Science Data Center, has a slightly different name nowadays. Uh, so th th this graphic is just uh, different uh, space missions in astronomy only that NASA has been associated with. There's lots of other missions that NASA puts up related to science, including Earth science missions of, of all kinds, and solar astronomy, and planetary astronomy. I'm not even talking about planetary probes. These are just the astronomy outward-facing telescopes run by NASA. This is a very small tip of the iceberg of all the telescopes and all the data sets in the world that astronomers use. Okay, So we have lots and lots of data sets. Again, this whole collection here is less than one terabyte. 15,000 experiments, okay, not a big deal from space. But we have these things on the ground, so we have all this stuff. So your tax dollars at work, <laughs> people will ask me the question, so why so many telescopes? I mean, we only have one LHC, right? I mean, <laughs> why do we need all this, right? All right? Well, in a sense, it's, it's essential because what we're looking for are these patterns in very high dimensional radiation spaces. We got, we got gamma rays, we got x-rays, we got infrared, we got radio. Uh, so here's, our, here's, the, here's the discovery of the quasar, right? So the, the quasar was, a, was this funny radio signal. No one knew what it was. Uh, right after World War II, we took these things which we called radars, which we used to detect incoming <laughs> during, during the war. And when the war was over, we, we started using them with more sensitive detectors to, to, to measure the radiation from space. And people detected these funny galaxies. And so we finally confirmed what they were uh, through observations with an optical telescope. It uh, wasn't quite that small. It was the 200-inch uh, Palomar telescope, if you're familiar with that one, a little bit bigger than, <laughs> than this cartoon is the case. But it's, it's, it's the intercomparison of different data sets where the discoveries are made. So a lot of these discoveries, I don't have time to tell you the story, but every single one of the discoveries listed there, which is one of many in astronomy, would not have been possible. We would not have found these very interesting objects if we hadn't int compared between different types of wave bands, different energy bands uh, of our detectors. And so our astronomy, the old way, uh, of course, this is cartoonish here, uh, but it's not cartoonish because there's the famous wow object. Uh, I don't have time to tell you that story, but look it up on Wikipedia. So they actually thought that was the first thought where we heard an extraterrestrial communicating with us. Uh, it's called the wow signal. And anyway, so, so a lot of it was sort of like this, but now uh, we get to the point now where we actually uh, collect so much data uh, that we can actually use the data archive as our source uh, to study, okay? And that is... Uh, because astronomy, uh, 
has the ability to survey the sky. So it basically just map everything out on the sky with different wave bands to different depths and different time scales, et cetera. Now all this data is stored and astronomers can pose hypotheses and ask questions and do experiments on the archive. Okay, so a relatively small ar uh, such thing is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is named after the Sloan Foundation, who's a sponsor here today, thank you very much. <laughs> so the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, and I'll, I'll say it now, unless I forget later. So the LSST, the project I'm going to talk about next, the Large Synoptic Surveys, it's basically going to do, for 10 years, it's going to do the equivalent of one Sloan Sky Survey every three nights for 10 years. So that's essentially 1,000 Sloan Sky. So the Sloan Sky Survey is one of the, uh, the workhorses of archive astronomy, okay? So we call it, ar the archive is the sky, okay? So we do experiments, we do observations, we write research papers off of the data in the archive. Because basically the data were collected, and now scientists can sit at the comfort of their desk in daylight hours. And, now, and so again, th th what people are studying are new hypotheses, new, new, quest new scientific questions, new classes of objects, new features of known classes of objects, and so on, because no one's ever studied them to that depth before. So, the, so we, we're reaching this stage now where uh, I don't have to work at night anymore, but, but I do anyway. But <laughs> uh, so so I always, I always tell people, because my job as a data scientist, now people said, gee, are you, are you a relatively new in this thing? I said, no, my, my night job was always working with data. And my, <laughs> my day job was also always working with data, because my 20 years at NASA was always with data systems from these telescopes. So anyway, so I'm going to talk about this Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Uh, and it's, so this is a, a cartoonish drawing of it. Uh, there is a person here, so I, there's a very famous picture of the Atlas experiment, which I often show in, the, in talks like this, but I figured I didn't have to do that today with the person there, but you, you had a much better animated thing than, than I ever could have put together. But, 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 but something is slightly wrong with this. The artist who drew, who drew this diagram, uh, he actually drew a person here who must be at least 20 meters tall to, be, to, act, to actually be to scale. <laughs> so I don't know what, quite what the person was thinking when they drew this. Uh, but the telescope itself is, 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 an, is another one of these wonderful billion dollar projects. You're, you're, again, your tax dollars at work. Uh, so, the, so we have this uh, telescope. Uh, where is it? What is it going to do? Uh, it's going to be in South America, and, and it's being built now. Construction started in 2014. Uh, it will be operational for, the, it's gonna do, again, this 10-year survey of the sky, uh, starting about six, seven, uh, five or so years from now. And it's, uh, so basically what it does is it's going to do basically a, a, a complete map of the sky. We call it tiling the sky, just like you tile your kitchen floor. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have this uh, eight square degree camera, okay, which is about the size of your fist at arm's length, which is why I'm doing this. I'm not just po poking my fist in the air. Fist pump, yay. <laughs> so, they, so you do one of those... Uh, you actually, we do a pair of images for calibration purposes every 40 seconds, and it takes uh, three nights to tile the whole sky. And then we do that repeatedly for 10 years. So we call it cosmic cinematography. We're, we're going to have 1,000 visits to every single spot on the sky with the best camera ever built in the world. And it's gonna, so not only are we going to get these incredible images where we can co-add, which we basically beat down the noise and get some, the best calibrated images of the sky ever, but because it, we have this time series, we're going to be able to measure everything dynamically changing in our universe. Oh my gosh, we, are com we just cannot wait to get this thing. So our, our science requirements document says within 60 seconds, we have to tell the world everything that has changed in, an, in a, a piece of sky that we just imaged from the last time we looked there. That may not seem like a big deal, but we expect on any given night, there's going to be 10 million of these events. And every single image, we have 100 million objects we have to analyze in detail. And oh, by the way, because we are a forensic science, we don't throw away any of our data. We keep all of our data. <laughs> okay, so, so we're going to find... Uh, the complete inventory of the solar system, every moving object, asteroid, comet, whatever, piece of space junk, whatever, uh, even maybe the next killer asteroid, so stay tuned, we may be able to tell you when the Earth's going to end. Um, so we're going to be able to detect this, uh, the faintest supernovae ever, at the, uh, so because we're watching the sky continuously, again, like it used to be we had to be looking at the right place at the right time, and if you miss it, oh well, you like the, the, like the neutrino story, but now we're going to be mapping the sky continuously for 10 years, and so we're going to see the faintest supernovae ever, which will tell us more about the age and size and the actual geometry of our universe, of the nature of dark energy and so on, uh, optical transients of every kind, any kind of thing that goes bump in the night. Uh, but what excites me as an astronomer is that we're actually going to have the, the, the actual positions through proper motion if you're, and, and parallax, if you're familiar with those terminologies. So we actually know the positions and velocities of 10% of the stars in our Milky Way. The best catalog we have to date with that kind of data is one million. 
stars. We're going to have that for 20 billion stars. And essentially 10% of our Milky Way we are going to be able to map and tell you what's going on. And there's lots of reasons that really excites me as a colliding galaxy astronomer because we really believe our galaxy is made up of the collection of many small galaxies in distant past that merged together to build up our galaxy. And we detect that through all these streams of stars that are swooping through the galaxy. So you see a whole bunch of stars are all moving the same. All moving the same in different directions. <laughs> Lots of those streams. We're going to be able to detect that. So there's our, uh, again, cartoonish things. I blurred the young lady's face. I don't know this, since this is being recorded. <laughs> Nothing intentional there, but I didn't get her permission to show her face. Uh, so she's holding a cardboard cutout of our focal plane. So that's not the real thing. The real camera is about a quarter billion dollars. The data system alone is a third of a billion dollars. The rest of it is the telescope, <laughs> the other part of the billion. And oh, by the way, there's, there's private donors who contributed to the $30 million mirror. Uh, and that, that was necessary because the mirror had to be started in construction years before the telescope and we couldn't wait for the NSF and uh, National Science Board timing to get that started. Anyway, so, th so this focal plane is 200 uh, CCDs, each one is 4K by 4K, so this is a 3 gigapixel camera, got you beat. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so essentially one g 6 gigabyte image every 20 seconds for 10 years. So how does this compare to the, what I said, a space-based telescope, ground-based? The Hub, if we take all the data that Hubble, te Hubble Space Telescope, which is n n arguably the most famous telescope in the world for, of astronomy, if you take all the data we've collected from the Hubble for the last, well, by the time this thing goes up in space, three decades combined, this telescope will collect that same equivalent amount of data within the thir first 30 minutes of its 10-year operation. <laughs> for 10 years, okay. So, so, we, so, we're, so again, the data, the data volumes may not look ex astronomical, and they're not. <laughs> we had a plan to get some puns in here. To, okay. <laughs> we, did this, we did the study, we did the trade study, and determined by the year 2032, when this project ends, that 200 petabytes you'll probably have on your thumb drive. Th this, this is not big data compared to other data volumes created in the world. But what's scary, there's two other things that are really, really scary about this. One is the fact that we have over 200 attributes, 200 features, of over 20 trillion sources. All right, so looking for all, at all possible combinations of these astrophysical parameters to find interesting patterns, interesting trends, interesting correlations. It's about 10 to the, tw I guess, I estimate about 10 to the 23 possible combinations to explore. That's, we're not gonna do those, <laughs> that's too much. <laughs> It'll take us like 10 to the six lifetimes of the universe on a fast laptop to do that, so we're not gonna do that. But th the complexity of the data, the number of patterns we can search for, that's scary. Plus the fact that, that we're gonna get roughly 10 million of these things that go bump in the night every night. Something that's changed since the last time we looked here. And we have to notify the world within 60 seconds. That's the requirement that's imposed on us by the Congressional Mandate, National Science Board. We gotta do this. And again, they could be killer asteroids, no, not killer, they could be asteroids, supernovae, variable stars, uh, all kinds of things. What we're hoping we're going to catch, because we're going to be on air, facing, looking at the sky continuously, is the next time, after, after 2022, when there is a LIGO burst, we'll see it. All right? Because when LIGO sees something, all right, when it detects a, a, a gravity wave burst, it's like, where is it in the sky, astronomers ask. It's sort of like there. Oh, that's okay. We only have 20 billion sources there. <laughs> but, if we, but if we actually have the data in our archive, which we will, then we can go back on that date, that time, and see what it was, what, what's the object, what, and we'll know about it. So anyway, so there's lot, lots of really great science going on. I don't have time to tell it all. Uh, but I'm getting close to wrapping up here. But let me just mention and, and, and the next project. Uh, which I don't work on, so I don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, but this is not the biggest big data storm. There's this thing called the Square Kilometer Array. And as its name suggests, it, it occupies a square kilometer. Oh, not an actual physical space. It's an array of over 100,000 radio telescopes who, if you were to lay them side by side, it would be a square kilometer aperture. All right, so they're, they're actually spread between two continents, Australia and Africa, actually in South Africa and Australia. And so uh, the, the concept of radio synthesis, where you synthesize an image from all these different radio antennas, oh, th again, this is going to be a 200,000 sort of factorial problem to deal with. I can't even think what that means. Uh, but anyway, so it's going to produce a little bit of data. 
five zettabytes annually. So this is a couple of the detectors. I, I notice the one on the right, it says 157 terabytes per second. Again, we don't throw away any of this. So actually, there's an entire industry in South Africa around this project that is essentially, uh, there's actually was a, a diplomatic mission planned from the U.S. to, the, to South Africa uh, to actually use this project as a way of lifting the entire economic condition of the entire southern African continent just through the, all the technology that's required to do this project in Africa. So we've built lots of organizations, I'm not going to read through all this, uh, to deal with this, international and domestic organizations to deal with data. So ultimately what we're trying to do, this is my, my sort of like one slide but three layers <laughs> of, of uh, Michael's sort of version of different data, levels of data production, reduction, right, from raw to, to features to physics or astrophysics. And so, so the first thing we do to manage all this data in order to do discovery from is you're not going to like look at 100 petabytes of data on your laptop but we extract the features, same sort of story. You find the interesting patterns and features, either machine or human generated or even crowdsourced. In some cases, we're having great, great success with things. <laughs> People will identify the features and so that, that those feature descriptions is a much smaller amount of data, it's sort of essentially like meta tags, much smaller than the, the image size themselves. All right, then we extract additional context, like where in the sky was it, when did it happen, uh, what, ha what people have used this data. So we're actually doing sort of reverse analytics on this, saying which scientists have used this data? Oh, scientists who study variable stars, or scientists who study galaxies, or scientists who study whatever. That tells us more about the data just by who's using it than anything else. So add all this context, and now we can combine all that data with other databases that exist in this collection across our um, planet and um, do discovery. <coughs> okay, so I, we, we, with this whole curation collection and discovery uh, that come through these step process. And so we're really uh, ultimately solving this, uh, what is the nature of the universe, taking this very forensic approach, what does the data tell us? So, so just like in the olden days, we now know what the data tells us. <laughs> oh, yes, asteroid killed the dinosaurs. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> great. Soro. So thank you. So that was another great example, obviously, of just the, the colossal, really inconceivable scale uh, of the, the, the data that can be generated by some kinds of modern astronomy, physics projects. Um, one question, though, that's worth returning to is that one of how do we actually then retain all of this information for the duration of time that makes it important for science, and how do we how do we wrangle all of that data in a great, useful way? And to that end, I'm very happy to bring up our next speaker, uh, Michael Hildreth. He's a professor of phys physics at uh, University of Notre Dame. In addition to working on the CMS experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider, he's the PI for the NSF-sponsored DASPOS project, a collective effort to explore the realization of a viable data, software, and computation preserve architecture for high energy physics, about which he will tell us more now. Thank okay. you, Mike. Thank you very much. So uh, that is exactly what I'll tell you about. Um, <laughs> so uh, I work on the CMS experiment at CERN, um, actually I'm in charge of overall software development for CMS and have been involved in this interesting project for the past five years or so. So I'm giving this on, on, in be, on behalf of the entire team here, and so I'm there are many complicated moving pieces, and so I would like to give credit to all of these groups that have been working on this without identifying them specifically. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and tell you, okay, we have this data, we've analyzed this data. Now what do we do with those results? How do we save them? How do we keep them? Uh, how do we make sure that some of this stuff is reusable so that 10 years from now we may be actually to go back and say, oh, well, well, maybe we missed this particular thing in our data set. How do we reanalyze that? And as I'll try to, uh, to show you, it's actually quite complicated and it's a very messy thing and people are working very hard to come up with solutions that make this useful for both the public and, and scientists as well. So here's sort of the problem. And this was published in Nature about four or five years ago. These researchers asked actual researchers, well, can I see your data? And found that the, f the probability that the data from a particular published result was available decreased remarkably with time. And so if you go out 10 or 15 years, probably about half the data that people had that went into an actual published result was not there anymore. And so if you're not careful, we start to lose the data. And so this is a problem because 
things like the LHC or the LSST uh, cost billions of dollars. You run them for decades. And so if that data set starts to fritter away or become unusable, then that investment, you can argue, okay, we published a lot of papers, but if you ever want to go back and reuse that data for something, it's gone. And so if you're not careful, you have to just keep track of these things, and we, don't, we want to maintain this investment. So if you're looking at the questions of reproducibility, can I do that study again? How do I do that study? How was that study done? If you're not careful, you lose all the information that went into a scientific result, a scientific publication. And many governments and funding agencies around the world are now mandating, the EU next year will mandate that all research data that scientists produce will be public. And uh, they're not, as, as I understand it, giving lots of people additional funding for this, but it's, it's, it's going to be a mandate for EU projects. And it is also true in the US yeah. that we have a mandate that, we, that our data should be kept and it should be public. And so we're trying to grapple with this. What does this mean for a 200 petabyte data set? Uh, and, and, and who's going to pay that? And so that's one of the things that w there's a whole series of policy questions that come up. What kind of data do you save? Do you save all the data? Just the data that went into a publication? Um, where do we keep it? Because in principle, you don't have 200 petabytes in your basement to store this stuff. And then that becomes expensive. So who pays for this? Uh, I your typical federal grant here runs for about three years and then the money's gone. So if you want to keep data for 20 years, then that's a problem. And Again, there's the question of public access. If you make your data public, then you have to provide network infrastructure, uh, switches, power backup, whatever. And so that's, that's not free. And so I just, as a brief advertisement, we've been running workshops for the National Science Foundation to talk about some of these. And so if you're interested in a very long and boring report, uh, <laughs> you can go to that website. Um, and it, the new version of it will show up soon, actually, because we're still working on it. Um, but so let's talk about some of the challenges of keeping science results for years. So you can t people often talk about data preservation. So if you have a science data set, uh, you know, you can think of this as backing up your hard drive. This is relatively straightforward, but one of the problems, and I would still say that this is easy, is this it needs to be automatic. In other words, if you have your laptop and you want to save this data set, you want to be able to migrate that automatically to new storage technologies or whatever. So, but, I, but this is a technical question, and I would say that's relatively easy. The harder problem is that you have the, all of this knowledge that went into c analyzing that data and creating a publication. And so the software that you had and how you did the analysis, that information often goes missing. If I just handed you an Excel spreadsheet with no labeled columns and said, this is my data, then it's not useful for anything. So if you want to make your data reusable, you have to provide a huge amount of additional context. How the data was processed, lab notebooks, whatever, your web pages, uh, you had algorithms that you used to analyze the data, maybe you publish your software. Uh, now if you want to rerun that software, maybe you want to save the computing architecture, or at least some note of the computing architecture on which it was created. So this becomes a much more complicated problem, and the project that we've been working on is, tr is trying to address some of these questions. So let's go to the LHC for a second. So this is the CMS experiment on which I work. Uh, and so it's similar to the Atlas experiment, only a l kind of more smaller. The, the C stands for compact. Uh, <laughs> so it's compact, but it's... So if you wrap the Atlas detector in, in, in saran wrap, it will actually float, we think. Someone did, the, someone, did the, someone did the calculation. The CMS detector uh, is much more dense, so it would definitely sink. Um, okay, but let's, let's go back to the, the data tiers for a second. So if, uh, if we have the, I'm gonna run back through the, the same data tiers that Mike talked about earlier. So I have process data from the LHC. Then we do some sort of selection or simplification, and we have some reduced data. And then maybe we reduce it again just to get a smaller data set that we can look at. And then I take that twice reduced data and I have to compare it to simulation. I do similar, some, some more analysis. Maybe I have some more inputs and I find the Higgs boson. <laughs> okay, so that's great, except now if you want to remember what you did to produce this discovery, you have to preserve all of this stuff. Otherwise you have the published paper and you have no way of reproducing it. And so this, these are the kinds of questions that we're trying to address. So I like to make the analogy to pizza preservation. <laughs> so if you take one thing away from this talk, think about keeping a pizza. So, all right, you have a pizza and you want to save it. Okay, so if you want to keep it for a short term, you can put it in the fridge and hope that when you get back to it the next week to eat it, it's not moldy yet. And so now we can do the same thing with scientific results and computation where you have your code and your archives and so forth. And six months from now, you can probably still run it. 
So that's the, that's the refrigeration model. Uh, so then you can go talk about frozen pizza. So you can preserve your pizza, you could stick it in the freezer, and until freezer burn takes over, you can still access that pizza. <laughs> and so the same thing one can do with analysis code and operating systems, you can take your code, you can freeze it, you can put it in it, you can save the virtual machine that ran your code, uh, you can put it in a container. I'll talk about these topics in a minute. Um, and these are the same procedures, by the way, that, and this is one connection that I want to make it during this talk, that are used for remote computing. If you can bundle up all of your stuff and ship it off to the cloud, you've effectively preserved it. And so cloud computing or distributed computing and preservation actually go hand in hand. And many of the technologies that have been developed for that kind of computing are directly relevant for preservation. Okay, but so until your freezer burn takes over, which means from a computational perspective that your operating system no longer runs the things that you've preserved, uh, then you're good. And then of course, you can go all the way to the end here and talk about recipes. So if I give you a complete set of instructions, ingredients, procedures, and so forth, you can repeat the analysis. Now, of course, for something like the LHC, you don't have the, you can't re redo the 200 petabytes of data, but you might be able to follow instructions and redo an analysis on the data sets that we've made public. So let me skip then to the project that we're working on. This is the DASPROS project, which stands for Data and Software Preservation for Open Science. I didn't come up with the name. Um, <laughs> but what it is, it's a multidisciplinary effort. I showed you the universities, and there's some national labs involved as well. And what we're trying to do is to look at these questions first from a high energy physics perspective, but roping in as many different scientific areas as possible. We work with biologists, astrophysicists, di digital curation, other disciplines, because in, in we're basically solving the same problems. And so what's unique about this is that it includes physicists, digital librarians, and computer scientists all working together because, because we all bring different areas of ex expertise to these problems. And so we're, since we're basically trying to preserve the knowledge behind a scientific result, there is a lot of commonality across disciplines. And so we're trying to develop descriptions of what is in the data and how it can be used, and we call that metadata, uh, typically. And so this can be very complicated, but it's a machine-readable way of saying, what did I store and what did I do? We're looking at computational descriptions. How did I compute? What did I compute? What was necessary for me to compute? And then we're spending a little time talking about policies as well. And so I like to say that this is a T-shaped project where there's a lot of broad outreach to other disciplines and commonality, but we're also actually building, oops, that's the wrong way, we're also actually building uh, a, a technical infrastructure. So let me translate this first though into, uh, I'm going backwards. Um, so what we're trying to build here is automatic pizza freezers <laughs> and automatic recipe generators so that scientists and the public can have access to this thing. And so uh, the technical side of this is that we're, we're building a, a sort of test knowledge preservation system. And so this is kind of a scouting party in that we're trying not to solve the world's problems here, but we're trying to go down a road in one direction as far as we can get and understand the different aspects, the different problems that one might encounter, bottlenecks and so forth, so that we can propose some solutions. And so we're building this this system, and I will talk a little bit about this, and th at the moment, the, the manifestation of this is the CERN analysis preservation portal that we're helping to build. And so this is a template architecture, if you will, for kind of a data no software knowledge preservation system. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about a sample computation. So you have your executable, and it has a version, and it needs to run, so this is just a computer program, it needs to run on some operating system, which has a version. And it might depend on some external libraries, which all have versions. And then you drive it with some configuration file, which tells it what to do, which probably has a version. And then maybe it talks to databases off, uh, off, of, off platform. Maybe it has some external inputs or something that it needs from elsewhere. OK, so that's, in general, what you would do. You say, OK, if I'm going to run my executable, OK, that's, that's sort of the, the information that I need. So now I have some input files which I would like to process through this. And then I'm gonna create some outputs which I'm really interested in. But now if I want to save all of these output files here, then I need, and I wanna know how they were generated, I need to save the information about everything on this slide. And so you could have many different dependencies, many of them are versioned. You could have thousands of input files that are computed upon and saved like we do with the LHC. And I'd wanna save the providence of each and one of those things. 
uh, and you could have many of these steps in an analysis. So you can see that it becomes very, very complicated. In fact, the metadata description, if you want to look at a metadata structure just to describe a computation, and many of these sort of boxes actually need an additional information to fill them in, it becomes very complicated. But this would be a machine-readable description of what I just showed you on the previous slide. Okay, so the th sorts of things that we've been developing are tools to capture these computation steps and reinstantiate them. The execution environment that you run on, so the operating system and the dependencies, and then the workflows that you run to actually reproduce these things. And so, and then we met describe all the things with metadata. And so if you want to make a system, you have to have all these ingredients. And so I'll tell you a little bit about some of these. So first, let's talk about containers. How many of you know what a Linux container is? Okay. Okay, so that's good. I have this, this, this slide here. So, so imagine that you have your operating system, and I want to run my computer program on it. Now, I may need some resources that are provided by the computer on which it's sitting. And I'm, but I may need some special things, and I may have some other things that are generic to that computer. And so the idea of a container is that you take the things that you want to run, which are these sort of different colored blocks here, and then I put, I put them inside of a box that allows me to plug into the computer that I'm sitting on. And so a container is something that allows you to, to take these boxes and ship them all over the place. As long as they land on this thing, this Docker engine, uh, then it, that thing can interpret the instructions from your computer program, and pretty much as long as the computer that you're sitting on is, is allowing it to do that, can run anything that you can put in the box. And so this is a really flexible way of making your computation portable. And so if you can make these boxes, you can take your computation and ship them pretty much anywhere in the world, and it will run. And so this technology is basically taking over, to a large extent, what people are doing in large-scale computation. And the nice thing about it is that what this essentially does is to capture a computation step. And so you can put it in a box, and you can both preserve it and ship it around. And so and this turns out to be way faster than some of the other ways that people were doing these, which were sort of virtual machines. And so, so this requires a container-ready infrastructure, but once you do that, you've preserved and can make portable the thing that you're trying to compute. So this is a, a nice advance, and it is gathering a, quite a bit of momentum across the computing landscape. So one of the things that we've been working on is to extend this. So that box now, here's, a bo here's your, your container, is this, this little square here. What we're trying to do is to add descriptive information and provenance information to these containers so that now, instead of just having a computational box, it's, it's a black box, you don't know what's in it, we're adding some tags to it that say, okay, in this box is this and that, and these, it does this computation, needs these inputs and outputs that came from here, and now if you do that sort of thing and you add this metadata to it, you can put it in some sort of storage or knowledge graph and say, hey, how many containers do I have out there? Oh, this one does that computation. Oh, I can pull that out and reuse it. And so, we're trying to make the, these things discoverable and reusable as we go through. And so this is one aspect of the kinds of things that one needs to develop an architecture to make sure that the computations that you're doing are both preserved and reproducible. Okay, so let me now talk about the CERN analysis portal. So what we're building here is the infrastructure to capture the description of a physics analysis. This is particular to high-energy physics, but the problems that we encounter are basically the same. Now, I don't expect you to read this, but all the experiments created what we would call knowledge maps to describe all the different components that were necessary to completely, I should say, I use the word describe twice, the, the, uh, all the different aspects of a physics analysis and how you would then be able to say, okay, well, I did this analysis, I have all this different information, this is from the CMS experiment, but it has, you know, the data about the analysis, some publication, review, um, and so these are very complicated things if you want to rec record, record everything. And so just to give you some idea of scale, this little piece up here at the, at the corner, um, so that, if you want to expand that to a machine-readable definition, it would kind of look like this. Okay, and so this graph expands sort of fractally to, uh, to allow you to see it. Okay, but so, so this thing that I showed you here is just the description of the analysis. It tells you what you did, but it doesn't tell you how you did it or how to redo it. And so there's another aspect of this, which is the capturing of this computation. So let me talk about something called Recast, which is a product, a project that, that is also associated with us. Um, the folks down the road at NYU are sort of leading this, but also I thought I would give them a shout out here. So imagine this analysis that I just talked to you about. 
you have a path where you have your data, you filter it, you get reduced data. If your simulation, you filter it, you get reduced data, you compare them, you make a result, you discover the Higgs boson. Okay, let's say you want to reuse that. Um, imagine, though, that you were very worried about the, the uh, intellectual property of your data and so forth. What you could do is internally preserve all of these workflows. In other words, you don't release the data, but you have this result. You allow people who want to test new models to provide you with a new simulation that gets run through the same data path. And so the, you can test these new models against your data result by just rerunning this chain over here. And so as long as you preserve the capability to do all of these things, you can expand your use of that original result by comparing the data result against new models to try to see if that model is good or not. And so this requires the preservation, though, of all of this computational infrastructure. Now, we somehow call this folding rather than unfolding because what we're doing is actually messing up the simulation by running it, the, the new models by running it through all the detector simulation to make it look like the real data as opposed to unfolding the real data to make it look like theory. But, okay, that's a, a technicality. <laughs> um, in any case, so, but this idea of preserved workflows is something that sh will come up here in terms of what we're doing with the CERN analysis portal. So now we're creating this thing called RIANA. And so the analysis preservation with all that giant work uh, 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 knowledge map information that I showed you a minute ago will sit up here, but you will also have created the ability to preserve workflows and chain them together. And so you can store these workflows in, in the portal, but then we've crea we're creating the infrastructure to reinstantiate them. And so all of the information about the data, the software, and the environment and workflow can be passed into this, this giant p yellow thing, which will can queue up all the jobs and will rerun the analysis for you, pull in the data, and be able to completely rerun and recreate the entire result. And so once this job engine gets information, it goes out, finds those containers, chains them together, it now runs on CERN OpenStack, which is a distributed computational infrastructure at CERN. And so these, this is now uh, almost ready to go online later this year. And so just let me give you a little bit of a, a down in the weeds picture. So you can specify your workflows. And we have some visualization tools that let you see. And so these are complicated things. And so we are able to describe it with just simple data and the containers that, can, that use the computation all of the different workflow pieces, chain them all together, and rerun the complete analysis. And so each computation is preserved in a container, which means you can shuffle them as long as you know what you're doing, because we know what the inputs are and what the outputs are, so you can reuse these pieces. And so it really, you re there's an arbitrary composition of steps as long as it makes sense that's possible. So we're approaching some kind of re reproducibility, reuse, but as well as preservation. So, okay, I'm gonna stop here. Um, I hope I've convinced you that knowledge preservation is a complicated mess, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's worth doing. Um, and we're still working through this. I mean, there are many tools that are missing. Uh, and so there is a lot of interest in this, and it, not just in high-energy physics. I mean, people are looking at the questions of reproducibility uh, across all of science. Um, this analysis portal, I think, will be our, our first demonstration of, of the knowledge preservation infrastructure, um, and in, in particular, the capability to reinstantiate the computation, which is, uh, I showed you how complicated it was, we can actually do it. Um, and so I would say that uh, ease of use is still missing, uh, and so we need to work on that. Um, and the discoverability aspects of this, the, we'll have those, but we don't have a good you know, international database of high energy physics analysis tools or anything like that sort of thing. So we're still working on that. So um, let me just sort of come back to that. I think tools, just if I may have a final slide here, mm -hmm. are the key, and I've, th I've stolen this, uh, this cartoon that used to have biology things over here, but I think it's more appropriate to really have scientists on one side and archivists and data scientists on the other, that they should be able to talk to each other. And one of the things that's missing are the tools to allow the scientists to preserve it, what it is that they're doing so that it can be stored properly. That's a big gap, and that's what one of the things that we're trying to fill for the next show. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. That, uh,
very apt way of queuing up where we're going next. Uh, so what, what makes science science is the fact that we don't just collect, of course, all this in sort of information, then hide it away under our beds, our gigantic beds that can hold <laughs> 20, thousand petabytes of information. No, no, in fact, we act the, the, the key to science is that we actually then need to be able to share it and communicate it uh, to others for the purposes of collaboration and general enlightenment. And uh, we're happy now to have uh, Anita DeVard who will be able to uh, tell us more about that. She has a background in low temperature physics, um, but she joined Elsevier in 1988 as its physics publisher. Uh, for 20 years, she's been working on bridging that gap between science publishing and computational and information technologies. And I'm very happy to have her tell us more about that. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's tremendous to be here. And I, I'm so honored and, and really delighted to be after this uh, wonderful lineup. I think what we're hearing about, these are the Colosseums. These are the cathedrals of our time. And it's fantastic to see this incredible expression of humanity, you know, this is, this is what we're doing. These are the pinnacles of our current culture. I really firmly believe that, and it's amazing to see that and hear so many of these great efforts um, in one room. So um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about big data and the future of publishing in physics and other areas, except I don't really think it's the future. What we are hearing here is happening right now. We're not, we're not painting some rosy picture 10 years down the line. This is happening now. These measurements are happening. These telescopes are being built and utilized. Um, and so we need to address if in this very distributed world, um, not just how do we do this research, but how do we share the knowledge that's being created in all this research. So I was really um, thrilled to hear these three talks where I think uh, Michael Tutz, I love this slide on the, on the grid um, and the uh, intricate, complicated connections that are being built to just communicate this data and, and communicate this information. And you really see that data is distributed. That is obvious through all three talks. That is, that is happening right now. All this data is openly available um, and it's distributed. Um, and I also thought it was, actually I want to go to this one first, um, very interesting to hear Mike's talk, uh, to hear about tools that are becoming distributed. Um, you see the preserved workflows that can be stored, where you have this whole complex um, around the, the, uh, the tools which are all computational in many ways, and also we saw that in the talk about the ATLAS experiment. It's not just the collision, it's then how do you get from that collision to something that you can process. You know, that's amazing and it's great to see efforts to distribute and store these tools in the cloud. Um, and I think lastly where that leaves us, and that's, that's just so fascinating and again it permeates all three talks, is that ideas are becoming distributed. I, I took a small snippet from Kirk's slide um, which says we identify and characterize forensic features that are human generated and you tap the power of human cognition to find patterns and anomalies in this massive data set. Um, and I think those, these, these three things happening um, are an, an incredible revolution and really a watershed moment for science itself. Um, we, we see that data is distributed. There are many sources, formats, owners, types. You know, everybody stores everything in the cloud. It's become entirely ubiquitous. I can't even keep my pictures on my phone, you know. <laughs> Apple is like forcing me on a daily basis to put it in their cloud. Give it to me, give it to me. So there's this immense sucking noise from all the data that we're producing <laughs> by the cloud device cloud providers, um, and in sense, like, like with the water cycle, you know, you kind of have a kind of a convection. It goes in the cloud and it rains down uh, upon us um, through social media and through other, other methods. So you, you, you have this big, enormous cycle of data um, that's being, being sucked up and distributed down, as it were. Um, tools are distributed, of course, again. Um, so I love the example of Docker. Um, I also love the example of Jupyter Notebooks. And um, I was at a meeting in, uh, I misspelled notebook. Um, I was at a meeting in uh, Chicago a number of weeks ago, which was about the new forms for, um, for, for the university. And speaking with a lot of early career scientists, and they were saying, we communicate through Jupyter Notebooks. We communicate through code. You know, we don't write papers for each other. We, we, we send each other bits of runnable code. We, we execute each other's work. And this sharing of tools, I think, is ubiquitous and is absolutely happening at all levels of science, but especially where it really, you know, where the rubber hits the road, the grad students and, and others who are doing this on a daily basis, they're constantly sharing code. And there are new, there's a new cultures of developing around it, there are new tools, but essentially, you know, it's, we're there. 
And then, of course, ideas are becoming distributed. All of these thoughts, the thoughts about what the data looks like, how you run it, that's all distributed as well. There are lots of ideas connecting data with code, et cetera. Um, there are examples where um, you actually have computers be part of the hypothesis creation uh, cycle. You have computers that are part of uh, optimizing hypotheses, computers that, that generate, uh, so there are programs that generate hypotheses that then go off and find data, that then go off and find tools. So you're, you're, you're entering this networked knowledge in a way that's, that's never really happened. And I want to add to that the idea of MOOCs, of distributed learning, um, where actually you're involving people who are, who are not trained at a prestigious institutions, who cannot come to a, a wonderful university such as this one, but who can be wherever they are on the planet and learn a lot of this stuff. And I think the World Science Festival is brilliant because, and the fact that you stream a lot of it is even better because it means that you can add people, you can add brains to this whole equation. So I think what we're seeing, and this is a slide that is ubiquitous in all kinds of business magazines, and I don't particularly read them, but I was looking for something with a good graphic and I found this. Essentially what you have seen and what we are seeing is that, that um, the value of, of uh, production chains is moving from a linear system where you have suppliers, manufacturers, distributors going to consumers to a networked um, uh, uh, system where here the value is based not so much on the production of things but on the knowledge exchange that drives proactive production. So you, and, and I think it's very similar in, in, in science. You used to have somebody had data that came from an observation. Um, then they ran a tool to analyze this data. Then they wrote a paper about it and they sent it to someone and you got a, you know, a faxed preprint type of a thing. So it was a very one-on-one -on -one process. But now we have many uh, data sources that are accessible. We have many tools that are accessible. The, the tools can run on the data. The tools and the data are interchangeable. People like Mike Hildreth are making it possible for all these things to become interchangeable. Um, and then you have many participants and you have many outputs. You can tweet about it, you can share it, you know, in many different ways. So what you're really seeing is, is that science can now scale with the network. So the, the, this is something very, again, ubiquitous in business, but the idea is the network, um, that there's something called Metcalfe's law, and then there's Reed's law, which all of these are models of saying, you know, if you have a linear network, obviously you can only go from, from A to B in one way, but if you have a, a network situation, the value increases. If everybody has a phone, suddenly this network is unbelievably valuable, and so, it, it can actually scale with the number of nodes, and the nodes are data points, the nodes are tools, and the nodes are brains that are able to access this information. So not only are we building tools that, that absolutely boggle the mind and are in no comparison to anything we've ever created before, but I think in the background, the astounding thing is that all this knowledge is openly available to anyone on the planet. And, and all, this, all this knowledge you can run on your average laptop, which is affordable, you know, in, in youth swaths of, of the world. And I think that is an incredible moment to have happen. Uh, and in a sense, big data has made this possible, but it's not only in big data that you see this. This is happening uh, across the board in different sciences. Uh, the, the results and the tools are coming online and are made available to everyone. And I think it's, it's fantastic that this is happening right now because this is all the, the great part. However, there are also serious threats that are facing science. Um, one uh, crisis, I think, and, and I hear less about this in physics, and this was an interesting statistics, actually. I don't know if everybody can read it, but this is the reproducibility crisis. And if you talk to people in medicine and you talk to people in social science, this is a huge crisis facing their field. This is saying how much published work in your field is reproducible, and if you look at biology, you know, over half the biologists say that more than half of the, pay of the work in my field is not reproducible. That's pretty serious, right? So somebody did something, but there's no way, no matter if you have Mike's pizza recipe or you have a freezer or whatever, it cannot be reproduced. In other words, it cannot be validated. Uh, social science is very serious, and I'm, I'm sure this little bump at the bottom there is largely social sciences, but also in other fields, in earth and environmental sciences. Almost half the people you know, say that uh, no, more than half the research cannot be reproduced. 
So, so um, I don't know if you all know the, the, the Richard Feynman. Again, this is quite text dense because it's a, it's a beautiful talk. And if you don't know it, I really urge you to seek it out. It's the 1974 address by Richard Feynman to Caltech, where he talks about cargo cult science. Um, and essentially, he says, it, scientific integrity is everything we have, right? Science needs to rely on integrity. And what does integrity mean? If you're doing an experiment, you shouldn't report everything that you think it might make it valid. You should also report everything you can come up with that might make it invalid. And any details that could throw doubt on your interpretation must be given if you know them. So this is a, a rigorousness of thought that, that Feynman was incredibly sort of devoted um, and I think all great scientists are devoted to this honesty. You know, you can't just say, I want to find something and, hey, gee, there it is, let me publish a paper. You know, I mean, you must spend a significant amount of time and energy in disproving what you hope is true. And you must spend a lot of time and effort in getting as many people involved to help you try to prove it's not true. That's the only way we'll ever get anywhere, otherwise it's all built on sand and fluff. And if you make a theory, he says, you must also put down all the facts that disagree with it, as well as all the facts that, that agree with it. So again, a deep honesty. Um, and, and if you have a lot of ideas to make an elaborate theory, you want to make sure that those things it fits are not just the things that gave you the idea for the theory, this is a really subtle one, but they must make some other something else come out right in addition. You can hear Feynman's amazing tone of voice here, but I think this is a, is a tremendous call from the past to any of us who in any way partake in any part of the scientific process. This type of honesty, again, is I think is, is essential. So that's one of the crises. I think another crisis is really, if you look at those three clouds, the data cloud is exploding, we saw that. The tool cloud is exploding. What's not exploding is the number of brains dealing with this process. So this, these are statistics from the uh, American uh, Physical Society. These are the number of graduates in physics in the US, um, and it's pretty much flat. I mean, you can be optimistic and say it's going up, but essentially, um, this is STEM overall, so there's a little more, but, but physics is pretty flat. And then you look at this, the, um, this is, these are the percentage of people getting a degree in physics who, have, who are temporary residents of the US. So they will leave, right? In, in, most, in many, many cases, these are people who simply are not able to stay in the US because they uh, have, have issues getting a visa or anything like that. And so the doctoral degrees, so over, if you, if you, if you mu essentially multiply that one, the, the green one is the doctoral degrees, so you're at half of this, right? So our, our under, our, the number of people involved in interpreting all this knowledge is not going up. It, to the extent that it should, given, given the cathedral. We're building cathedrals, but we have no one to, to fill them, you know, a, a, to the extent that, that it could. Um, and so I think we need all the brains we can get. And to paraphrase Remy the Red from Ratatouille, not everybody can be a great scientist, but a great scientist can come from anywhere. Um, so I think, I think this is a huge point. It's essential because these technologies can now bring science not just citizen science. I love citizen science. I'm not crazy about the phrase because it implies that there are real scientists and there are citizen scientists. I think the point is of distributed science that we allow everybody to partake in this process. By making these tools available, by having online courses by which people can learn to code, by having things like Stack Overflow where you have communication um, between people possible, everybody can become involved in science. And people who are you know, enthralled by, by the universe or enthralled by leptons or, you know, whatever it is, anywhere on the planet um, can partake in this. And I think that's, that's a huge opportunity. Um, and then as I was researching this, this bit about how many physicists are there, I was um, reading a paper that was um, about uh, the, the, in certain universities, this was talking about Miami, that closed its physics department because there weren't enough students of physics. Um, and there was a report being, being uh, mentioned by the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And I tried to click on it. And this is what happened. Um, so, I mean, I don't need to go into much more detail, but, um, right? Um, there you go. I mean, I, 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 again, I don't need to go into any more detail, but um, it's pretty clear that um, we don't exactly live in a time in which the government is the biggest um, fan of science. So I think that is a, that is a third threat. Um, and and uh, we need to make sure that 
our ways at getting of this information, our ways of putting out this information will continue to exist in ways that we can actually um, spur on science. So just as a, a, a summary of this bit, um, I think the, the, the network knowledge that we have, it can actually help address all three of these issues. So reproducibility, if you're disconnecting the creation of data from the information, from the interpretation of it, that's really helping you to prevent confirmation bias, as it's called. They're, they're not my data points, so I can be critical about them. Or they're not my data points, so I can also look at the ones that don't match my theory. I'm not going to be blind to the things that don't support my hypothesis. I'm actually going to make sense of the whole of it. Um, the lack of brains, so making these data and tools available to the whole planet, um, can help interested outsiders to explore new interpretations. It can also support tutoring, online tutoring, where you have people who are maybe, maybe based in a rural location or in a location where there's very little access um, to people, and you have these brilliant lectures online that you can access anywhere, and you, you can also make the connection to scientists who are, who are working on these topics. And I think um, if we're looking at, at an era where, where the funding for science is, is by no means guaranteed, it is useful to see these systems where many, many players take part in this entire infrastructure. I love the example where you had private funding for the, for the mirror of the telescope, and I think that's kind of a, a metaphor. You have components of private parties or third parties or international collaborations, many different models that are not simply only, in this case, the US government funding science, where you, you have a redundancy in the system where you have different players so that there isn't that very strong dependency on one source of funding so that if that is under threat, you still have things staying up, you still have things running. Um, and so, again, the, the having, allowing different parties to participate and putting data sets in multiple places can really help uh, make sure that we have something that's robust and sustainable and lasts and all of that. So, getting back to publishing. So, um, I'm, I'm actually not a physics publisher anymore. I, I was a while ago, but um, I've mostly been working um, in, in an area of how do you improve um, the scientific article? How do, you, how do you publish all of this? How do you share this knowledge in an optimal way? Um, this is a uh, stereotypical view of a research data life cycle, um, and so currently my job is to work with universities and institutions and organizations to see how can we contribute components to the research data life cycle. And um, so uh, in Elsevier, in our group, we're developing a number of tools, and these are some of the many, 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 many tools out there, and I could just populate this whole thing with a lot of tools, but since I work for Elsevier, I'll mention a couple that we do, but, but I'm just saying there are many of these. Um, we have a data search engine, we have an electronic lab notebook, we have a data repository, we have data journals where you can actually publish either a piece of software um, or a, a piece of data or something involving a method um, that you can talk about and, and some tools to support uh, institutions to gather metrics and to gather information about all of this. Our goal in doing this is to be components in this entire ecosystem. Um, and we very closely do that together with the organizations that are developing. And I think, I guess, if you want a, a fourth network that's becoming distributed, are multi-stakeholder organizations that are often international and that often cross domain boundaries and they cross, like Mike was mentioning, pulling data librarians into DASPOS. And, and again, these problems are, have, are very, very multifaceted. There are scientific problems, there are technical problems, there are social problems in some cases, or, or social solutions that you could support. Humanities, I think, have a very large role to play here um, in seeing science as a cultural enterprise. It's important that we get people involved who understand what cultural enterprises are like, how they work, how you can accommodate this. If you want people to share their data, what drives them? What are the benefits for them? We have a project to involve uh, researchers in economics to, to help us look at that. What are the real drivers that drive behavior? Data sharing is a little bit like recycling. You know, people used to not recycle and you wouldn't have any trouble throwing paper in the trash 20 years ago. Now you feel a twang of, you know, guilt when you do that. Um, similarly, hopefully, people will feel a similar a discomfort in not sharing their data, in not sharing their, or storing and sharing their full workflow. Um, so some of the projects we work with, the Research Data Alliance multi-stakeholder group who are um, international and who are trying to address, in, in particular, issues of data standards and interoperability. And there are many working groups, again, many stakeholders. Um, European Cloud Initiative, which is a counterpart to the, to the American Cloud Initiative. So they, they're trying to make the European Open Science Cloud, which will house um, the results and the methods and the workflow of, 
uh, European science outputs puts is in, and is being. Force 11, I'm, I'm particularly fond of, I actually co-founded it. It's a group called the Future of Research Communications and E-Scholarship. Um, and it's meant to, to pull together people from different sciences, from different communities, as well as librarians who know a lot about information and data, as well as software developers and publishers and uh, individual scientists who build a little tool to, to try to gather again in working groups um, around certain issues. So for instance, we came, came within Force 11 with a working group on data citation. Um, and there's a set of data citation principles that have now been adopted by most major publishers, including Elsevier and, and many others. Um, and so you see that, that these networks really reach across organizations, both commercial and academic. Um, Scholix is a great outcome, in fact, of RDA. Scholix is a linked data network um, that uh, contains the relationships between an article and a data set. So there's not always a one-to-one -one relationship, of course, it's end-to-end, -end, but if there is a relationship, a link between an article and a specific data set that you can address somehow with some unique identifier, this link is collected and is put into this great linked open data repository. And Scholix is completely open, and there are, I think, now 20 organizations contributing to it. Again, Elsevier is one of them. We were one of the founders and one of the people who have populated it because we find this to be critical and, and useful, and it can support the network effect. And as is um, uh, Springer and uh, Open Air in, in Europe and European PubMed Central and the Australian National Data Service, we're all contributing to this shared linked data space um, so that anybody can go in and find which data set matches with which article. Um, the National Data Service is a group I'm involved with on the steering committee, which is trying to be, um, as it were, a connective tissue between many of these different efforts. So you have efforts going on um, that you want to be, be able to run from one end to the other and between domains and such, and that's an NSF-funded project. So those are some of the projects that we're working with, um, and I have some more details on my slides, which I'll make available. So I really want to close off there, um, just in summary, as tools, software, and data, and brains is, shouldn't, so tools, software, data, and brains is what that should read, become distributed, science experiences, and network effect. And it can, uh, it has the potential to, to really ex uh, explode uh, science. So this can solve three crises. It, detaching observation from inter interpretation can combat uh, issues with re reproducibility. And if nothing else, you'll have other people to check what you did because it's all out there and available. Um, it can draw new minds to scientific reasoning. And I just want to really, really thank the organizers of the World Science Festival because I think festivals like these are how a lot of people get their first taste of what science can be. And it's hugely important that we're out there as scientists all the time talking about how amazing it is because it simply is amazing and getting kids interested and just having all kinds of people come in and look at what science does. Um, redundant storage and delivery systems and allow new, new players to add the cyber infrastructure, they relieve dependencies on government funding and therefore they make um, the whole system more robust and more redundant. Um, and then for publishing, uh, network science publishing really involves adapting to and being interoperable with many different platforms. So a key thing that we look at in the, in the tools that we're contributing is that we make sure that what we do is interoperable with as many other parts of the workflow as possible. Um, and uh, platforms, technology, and scholarly habits of practice, right? So, so it's very different if you're working in a wet lab to when you're working in an already distributed uh, environment. There's very great differences to people who create small experiments. Way back when, I had a little cryostat, and it was just me and my cryostat, you know, and I, my, my, my knowledge transfer was me writing something on a piece of paper. Now, there's not a lot of physics left like that, I suppose, but there is a lot of biology left like that. Um, so if, if there, it's not as obvious that you would need to share files or need to share uh, pieces of tools. And, and I think it's, it's interesting to see how that type of shift will happen in much more personalized types of science. Um, it's important to collaborate. I think we are all stakeholders and we all need to network. And I think these multi-stakeholder organizations are huge and, and complying with and developing new, new standards is very much a part of that. So that's really all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you.